you know, kind of weird to say. There's changes in the way the sun, moon, and stars are moving. There's all kinds of things. Time is being changed itself. Magnetic fields are changing. There's a lot of things that are going on. And uh, the reason I bring that up is I don't know if it had anything to do with the election or what, but there just seems to be such a rush towards Christmas that I'm afraid Thanksgiving is going to get buried like it normally does. We go from Halloween to Christmas anymore, and we kind of forget that Thanksgiving is stuck there in the middle. And, uh, you know, we really shouldn't have Christmas unless we have Thanksgiving, to, because that introduces us to it. So just keep that in mind. It'd be a week from this Thursday, how fast it's moving on us. I told Susan, I said, the next time she decorates in here, we'll have the lights on the Christmas trees for actual Christmas. And, uh, you know, goodness, how fast the year's gone by. So... We're going to uh, continue in our study of First Samuel this morning, but first let's go before the throne of grace and ask for the help that we need. Father, we worship you in your word. We bow down before your word. We bow down before you. We bow down in you, before you in worship. But Lord, again, as we always do, we ask you to help us because we know how infantile our minds are compared to yours. We realize how far away we can be from the truth without you guiding us and leading us. So, Holy Spirit, we, we start by confessing our need for you. We don't take you for granted. You come because you're asked to come. You are a gentleman and you are invited. And so, Lord, we say, please come. Open our hearts. Change us. Change our nature. Continue the work that's already been done. We are your handiwork and you will finish it, Lord, and you will present us perfect before the Father as you will all your children. So, Lord, we know we're in good hands. So help us this day to speak this word, to speak it with boldness, to speak it with clarity, to speak it with the intent of learning from it, of how to live our lives. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we started 1 Samuel chapter 24 this week. We, we, we finished with uh, chapter 23 last week. And as usual, David is being pursued by Saul, and he has to find hiding places. And once he seems to find a hiding place, Saul hears about it, and then David has to move again and again and again and again. And, and all this, if you're wondering, you know, why, why is God letting David go through all this? You anointed him when he was like 15 years old. Now he's going to go through almost 20 years of this wandering. But he is making a king. This is the king that he always wanted. He didn't, he didn't want Saul. The people insisted on Saul. But uh, God wants to give them David, and he has to make David the man that he is. So we're going through these things. And actually, I'm trying to get through both uh, 24 and 25, chapters 24 and 25, because they're related to each other. So let's see what we can find out. Uh, starting in 1 Samuel 24, 1 and 2. All right. Samuel 24, 1 and 2. Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Take note. He was closing in on David. David is hiding in, uh, in Gedi. And, uh, but the Philistines attacked Israel, and Paul, Saul had to break off and go that way. And uh, it, when Saul had returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Take note. David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel, and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. Notice that Saul doesn't take 3,000 men. He takes 3,000 chosen men. His army is bigger than that. But he takes chosen men. These are going to be like his SEAL team. This is going to be his SEAL team six that's going to get the job done. O overkill is tremendous. He's going to have 3,000 against David's 600. But it's really more like 3,000 to 1 because there's only one man who Saul hates, one man who has been loyal, one man who has fought the enemies of his nation, a public hero, and Saul wants him dead. You might also make note that the wilderness of En Gedi, it says in the next line that David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. That's what En Gedi means. It is way out in the wilderness. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a wilderness time. And uh, there's, some, there's a beautiful spring there in Gedi that is still there today, which is a beautiful place, but it's in the middle of just absolute wilderness. This is where God is bringing him, bringing David. And so now Saul has heard about this, so he's going to take these 3,000 chosen men and go find David in, in Gedi. So we look at the next verse, verse 24, verse 3 says, So he came by the sheepfolds by the road, 
and there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend to his needs. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Now, I want you to notice something here, because this has gotten me in trouble at the prison, and I just want to make sure I don't have that same repeat here. When I preach on Luke and the, and the Christmas story, we come to understand that when you go to Bethlehem, as they're there today, there are caves all over the place. There are limestone caves that are easily formed, and many believe that these limestone caves came from the time of Noah's flood. And the shepherds would take these caves, instead of building a stable, you know, as a, from scratch as a building, they used the cave and turned the cave into a stable. Because I, I was telling people that, and they said, well, he's not preaching the truth because the Bible said Jesus was born in a stable. You show me in the Bible where Jesus was born in a stable. It's another one of the things that we've just put in the mix that isn't really there. We just know there was no room in the inn, and they went in, in, into the place where Jesus would, would be born, but it's not called a stable. But it was used as a stable, anyway. And uh, anyway, uh, what I want you to see here is it says, So he came by the sheepfolds, sheepfolds by the road, and there was a cave, because this is where the sheep holds them. The shepherds used the caves. This is where Jesus was born, in a cave. And we'll get into that on the 22nd of December. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. And it says here that uh, the reason Saul went into the cave is he needed to attend to his needs. Now they have tried to pretty this up over the years. The different translators have tried different ways. But let me be blunt. He went in there to take a dump. That's too bold, but just the truth. He went in there to take a dump. So to do that, the way they dressed in those days, he had to take his robe off, set it to the side, squat someplace, and cop a squat and do his thing. Now, uh, again, like I say, they've tried to, uh, to make this prettier, but there's nothing pretty about it. So he's in the same place where David is taking shelter, and he goes in to, take, to relieve himself to have this bowel movement. What does that tell us? Is this a coincidence? Is this a coincidence that David and his men would be in the same cave that Saul going down the road would stop and walk into? The, well, if it's not a coincidence, is it the will of God? Is it the plan of God? Is it under the sovereign God? Does that mean that our very bowel movements can be led by God? Amen, it does. God affects everything in our lives. I tell you what, the older I get and the things I've fought physically, when I have a good bomb, when I thank him, I, pr I praise him. You may think that's something an old man would say, but I tell you what, I understand why old men say it, you know. Uh, you know, your body changes in time, you know, especially if you're on certain pills and different things. But, you know, to realize in all humility that God uses everything for his glory, everything for his glory, even in this case for a man to uh, relieve himself, that leads to our whole story here. So let's go on to verse 24.4. Then the men of David said to him, they must have been you know, far enough back from him that they couldn't hear him talk. They couldn't hear him talk. This is a massive cave because David's got 600 guys in this cave with him. And Saul is, you know, and this isn't a lit cave or sun shining in or anything. He's got to walk through the dark. He certainly doesn't see them. He certainly doesn't hear them. He thinks he's got some privacy, but he really doesn't. It says, then the men of David said to him, this is the day of which the Lord said to you. In other words, David must have recounted this to them. This is the day which the Lord said to you, quote, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your, hand, into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now what do you think? Here's this man saying, David, this is not a coincidence. The man who is trying to kill you and us. Remember, this isn't just David. He's got 600 guys that have been faithful, and you know Saul, if he kills whole towns, he's going to kill every one of them when he captures David, if he can capture David. And so, he, David arises, he sneaks up there, and he cuts off, a, you know, obviously that uh, Saul is not wearing his robe, he has to set it off to the side. David goes to the robe, cuts a square off, and goes back to his men. Now, what do you think when David comes back with this, this square? Look, guys, I cut off a piece of his robe. Are you nuts? God has put him here for you to kill. You told us that God said, Behold, the day will come when I will put this man into your hand. He's trying to kill you. He's trying to kill us. And you're cutting pieces off his robe. We'll go kill him for you. And for us. You just sit and watch and we'll take care of it. If you don't want to get your hands dirty, we'll take care of it. You can't, you can't blame him. 
They're running over hell's half acre, wherever they can go, trying to get away from Saul, trying to get away from Saul. Hell is following them. This demonic man is following them and going to kill all of them. So that's what 20, verse 24 for. David, if you've if you, you got to admit, you can't, this can only be an act of God. This couldn't happen again in a million years. God has put your enemy in your hand. And look at the way it is. Look what an embarrassment that's going to be. The great king Saul killed, taking a dump. That's got to be a headline people are going to laugh over, you know. And it uh, goes on to say then, let's go to verse 24, 5 through 7. It says, now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him. That heart is the same interchangeable word for spirit. Now it happened afterward that David's spirit troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. Feels bad about cutting the robe. Doesn't imagine how he felt if he had taken his life. But he feels bad about cutting his robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. His heart was troubled because he had even taken that square of the robe. Why? Does David respect Saul? Not one bit. What does David respect? He's the king. He's the king, which leads us to our, our first, and, and nothing new to you, but our first teaching lesson out of this today is our next slide here. Even though you do not respect the person, you should have respect for the position of authority. Even though you don't respect the person, you should have respect for the authority of the position. I don't know if it was Donald Trump. I think it was, but I heard this some years ago, maybe the first time he was in office. They said he would never go into the Oval Office without a sport coat on and a tie, because, or a suit and a tie, because he felt like there was a honorability to that office that even he wanted to remember that this is not his office, this is the people's office, and the historical aspect of all of this, and he would not go in without wearing a suit into that place where others would maybe wear a sweater or something like that. He said he wouldn't. Uh, so again, he, uh, he didn't respect Saul, but he respected the office. And uh, if Saul is to die, it's, going to be by, it's not going to be by David's hand. Now this is going to play into the next story as we progress because here everybody is pushing him to kill Saul. And you can understand why. If you were with David, what would you have said? I'd have said the same thing. Man, this won't happen again. I mean, how can this ever happen? Here's your enemy sitting there. Just kill him. And we can kill him without killing all ourselves because he's got a bunch of men on us. He's got 3,000 chosen men. He's got his SEAL Team 6 outside. He's come in. You couldn't ask for more. Let's put an end to this. I don't care if you go out there and holding his head up and showing the victory like you did Goliath, but let's get over this thing. So it says, David also arose afterward, went out of the cave, and called out to Saul, saying, Now you can imagine, D David hasn't killed him. He's letting Saul get away. Saul's going through the front of the cave. David gets up. They know he's not going to kill him. He's already said, I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. Well, then you know what they're thinking? Then sit down! Why are you going out of the cave and following him? There's 3,000 chosen men out there. You know, they, get, get the story right. They're not sitting there going, oh, David's going to go out and talk to him. Where in the heck are you going? Don't you love us? You're going to get us all killed. Stay hiding. That They'll move on. They'll never even know we were here. But David goes out under the inspiration of God. David also arose afterward, went out of the cave, and called out to Saul, saying, My Lord the King! And when Saul looked behind him, how, how weird that had to have been to not know that somebody had been right there. David, stopped, David stooped with his face to the earth, and he bowed down. He assumes the position of the servant. It says something about his character. He assumes the position of the servant. And he says to Saul, David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of the men who say, Indeed, David seeks our harm. Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave. And someone urged me to kill you. Yes, yeah, some 600 urged me to kill you. But my eye spared you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, 
Yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the corner of your robe, I did not kill you. Know and see that there is neither, neither evil or rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you. David wants to clear the air. He wants to clear his own spirit. He wants to clear his relationship with Saul. You know, and, and he just wants him to know. And it's a good thing. It really does make sense. I could have killed you and I didn't. Why do you listen to these people who say that I'm against you? But he's also got that still that evil spirit from the Lord that's telling him these things. So we go on then. We continue 1 Samuel 24, 8 through 15. He says, Yet you hunt me, you hunt my life to take it. Let the Lord judge between you and me. In other words, let's let God settle this. Let the, let the Lord judge between you and me. You remember that, that Saul used those same words when he thought when, it, when he was asking the people to judge between him and Samuel, or, or, or rather between Saul and uh, his son, uh, uh, oh, help me here, uh, Jonathan, when Jonathan went in the woods and ate the honey, remember back in that story? And Saul was so mad about it because the people ate, even though he went, they'd been chasing his enemy all day and he wouldn't let them eat. And, and uh, uh, Jonathan, not having heard that, went into the woods, found the honeycombs and ate them and it refreshed him. And you'll remember he said, Let the, he said somebody took this honey. Somebody, somebody has disobeyed God is the problem that we're losing the battle. Therefore, let, 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 let God be the judge between me and Jonathan. So this is nothing new as a way to bring attention to something. He says, let the Lord judge between you and me. David's just taking that same course. Let the Lord judge between you and me. And let the Lord avenge me on you. But my hand shall not be against you. He's, he's saying here, you know, he respects the office, but he doesn't respect him. And he's telling me, he says, I let, the, let God avenge me on you. In other words, I'm not, trying to, I'm not asking God not to avenge me. I'm not asking God not to have, bring punishment to you. I'm just saying it's not going to be by my hand, but God will do it. Now remember this when we come to the next story that we're building up to. He says, God will do it. It's not going to happen by my hand. Okay. God uses wicked kings. God uses... Oh, I went ahead of myself here. Okay, David calls out to Samuel this confession, my Lord, my King, and then takes this position of a servant. Uh, tells him the things that we've just talked about. He, God did not uh, deliver you into my hand. I didn't take advantage of it. And one of the things we learn from this one of the things we learned from this is in Romans 12, 19 through 21. Let's go to that one. Romans 12, 19 through 21. This is another one of take off, take off lessons here. It says, Paul writes, Beloved, now this comes to us. Are we beloved of God? Yeah. Amen. Then he's, uh, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. In other words, it says, means make a place for it. Have some place to put it, but don't carry wrath in you. Get rid of it. Find a place for it. Do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. How many of us know that verse? We all know that verse. We've learned that verse since we were little, that God will repay, that vengeance is, is the Lord's. But how many of us actually believe it? And why do I say that? Because we try to take the situation in hand. We try to be the one that brings the correction. We try to bring the vengeance sometimes. And this is really going to be hot from I preach the same thing into the prison this afternoon. Because a lot of these prisoners are mad at some people. They're ready, they, I think they'd kill them if they could. They've lost their lives. They've, uh, they're lost in the prison system. Uh, they've been separated from their families. They've been separated from their kids and everything else. And uh, I've heard, I heard a number of them say, you know, wait till I get my hands on these people. And of course, we bring them into Christ to change that nature. Uh, but, but human nature as it is without Christ, it's exactly what they think. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore... Paul takes it first. It's just a matter, not just a matter of not avenging yourself. It's, it's a matter of, he's not saying, that we could stop it right here and say, God says don't do bad things to people, I'll handle it. But it doesn't. It doesn't let us off by simply what we shouldn't do. It also tells us what we should do. He goes on to say then, he says, for in so doing, or he says, therefore if your enemy is hungry, feed him. 
If the guy who's trying to kill you is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How often sometimes we take the tact that says, well, I've tried to be this guy's friend. I've tried to be nice. I've, I've tried to conduct myself. I've, I've tried to keep peace and this sort of thing. But I can't take it anymore. And I just want to give this person a piece of my mind. I just want to tell them, you know, uh, what's what and uh, bring them around and so on. And he says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. He says, find a place to, uh, to put this wrath. Uh, just so far in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Well, I thought that that was an analogy of punishment when I, you know, some many, well, a number of years ago. I thought this was an analogy for punishment because if you do this, and God's going to be the vengeance. God, in a sense, God's the one putting the coals on her head. You know, you just see taking that coal and going into you know, a person you were mad at, a person you hated, or something like that. You know, and uh, so you know, this God is dumping these coals on their head as part of His vengeance. That doesn't mean that at all. You guys know that in the Middle East, custom was to take everything on your head. They, they would walk with water bottles on their head, jars on their head, firewood on their head. Everything would go on their head. And they wouldn't even have to have their hands up. They were so balanced. They were so used to this that, you know, they would just walk through town like that. And the coals were very important because nobody, nobody has a match. In that day, you didn't say to somebody, hey, my fire's out. You got a match? You know, it doesn't work that way. You might have, I don't even know how they started fires, but I don't even know how they knew about flint back then. But having a fire, every house would keep a fire going. doesn't mean you'd have a raging fire through the day, but it meant that you'd keep coals there that you could bring back at night or bring back at cooking time. But normally this assignment was given the young children in the house. is one of the first chores they had was always watch the fire. Never let it go out. When it gets low, put at least another piece on to keep it going. So fire was a means of eating, it was a means of protection, it was a means of warmth, it could be a means actually of, of not dying because you had a fire. And uh, you didn't give fire away easily. It's like, ask me a lot of things, I'll be glad to loan you some sugar, some flour, anything else, but don't ask me for my fire. But he says, but, he, but Paul is saying here, if you see anyone walking through a town and they've got a fire on their head, they've got these coals that they're carrying back to their house, it tells you something important. It tells you somebody loves them. Because nobody gives up their fire unless they have a love for somebody that is so great that they would take the chance of losing their own fire to give their fire away. And so this is all that, all that uh, saw, or Paul is saying here is that we should give place to wrath, get it out of our lives. There's no place for it. Dialogue, uh, an honest debate is always good. But there's no place for wrath. So that was Romans 12, 9 through 21. Let's look at, uh, let's go back to 1 Samuel 24, 16. So it was, now he's, he, you know, he's had this conversation with Saul. So it was when David had finished speaking these words to Saul, that Saul says this. He says, is this your voice, my son David? You know, he turns around, David's called to him. He turns around and looks at him. He says, is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. What a tormented individual. He's torn. That's an important word. He's torn between love and hate. It reminds, him of Je it reminds me of Jesus casting out a demon and for, from a man. And, and, the, and Mark says in his gospel that the demon tore him. We know that there is an evil spirit that God has allowed to come upon Saul. And we would not be surprised if that demon is not tearing him. Tearing him between love and hate. And Saul, Saul's spirit is being torn apart because of his disobedience. We go to the next verses, which is 1 Samuel 24, 17 through 22. Then he said to David, and how shocked David probably was to hear that, is this your voice, my son? David calling him his son. And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Then he said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me with good. Even Saul could understand that there was a rightness, a righteousness in what David had done. For you have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. Once again, he knows. And you have shown this day how you have dealt well with me. For when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. For if a man finds his enemy, uh, for if a man finds his enemy, 
Will he let him get away safely? Therefore, may the Lord reward you with good. May the Lord reward you with good for what, for what you have done for me this day. And now I know indeed that you surely will be king, and the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Therefore, swear now to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me, and that you will not destroy my name from my father's house. So David swore to Saul, which he'd already done previously, but David swore to Saul, and Saul went home, and David and his men went up to the stronghold. This finishes chapter 24. There's kind of a truce at the end of the story here. Saul goes his way, David goes his way, but you know it's not going to last. It's just a temporary thing. So we begin now in, in, in uh, 1 Samuel 25.1. Then Samuel died. How quickly the Bible has its eulogies. How quickly we don't, it, it's said and done. There isn't paragraph after paragraph that could be written about people. Uh, you know, to think about things that were done for, for Stephen and, and others. And I, I, it's, it's just a point that the Bible doesn't spend a lot of time on eulogies. Here is a man who is pivotal in the whole history of Israel. He's pivotal. He's the transition prophet. He's the pr transition high priest between the days of the judges and the coming days of the kings. It is Samuel that walks on both sides of that. It's Samuel that's tried to work all this out. And all we hear is, Then Samuel died. And the Israelites gathered together and lamented for him and buried him at his home in Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. A note you might want to make in your Bible that I've told you some time ago when we studied Mark about Jesus going to the wilderness. The word wilderness in Hebrew means to speak. Literally the word for the wilderness, the, the word wilderness in Hebrew, the key root of that word is the word to speak. So going to the wilderness, we call it the school of the wilderness because it's there that God speaks. And even if we don't have a physical wilderness to go to, there are times that God will make us all alone in the midst of many so that we can have a quiet time with Him. Out of the wilderness, God speaks. Out of that quiet time, God says things. And this, here we have, because this is like the third wilderness that's referred to that David has gone to. So David, Samuel is buried. One sentence devoted to a man's life. One sentence. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. This is the end of an era. Samuel is the last judge of Israel. He was a transitionary figure between the time of the judges and the time of the kings. God was, God was speaking to the kings through the... God will continue to speak to the kings through the prophets. And Saul served the purposes of God in his generation. May that be said for us all. We go now to 1 Samuel 25, 2 and 3. Now there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel. And the man was very rich. Not just rich, he was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. The, that's important that you realize you're going to hear about the shearing of the sheep. Think of this as their thanksgiving. This is the end. This happens at the time of the harvest. The harvest gets brought in from the fields. The sheep get sheared. It's that time in which it's kind of a party atmosphere. People are rejoicing over the harvest, especially if God has blessed them. And there's a good harvest. And you've got, you've got your livestock. And they're, they're shearing the, the, the sheep, which is a, their means of income besides the farming and everything else they do. So understand, to make, this, to make this story make sense, you've got to understand that it's kind of a festival time. In fact, it'll be part of a feast day that's going to be involved in this. But everybody, it's like everybody's just, you know, like the first Thanksgiving, you know, dancing around the maypole, and everybody's having a good time. Now, there was a man whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his doings. He was of the house of Caleb. I can find no connection why it says he was of the house of Caleb other than the Holy Spirit letting us know that this is a true thing. And if you don't believe me, you can go back and check this. He was of the house of Caleb. We go on to 1 Samuel 24, 4 through 8. 25, rather, 4 through 8. When David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, David sent ten young men 
A lot of young people gathered around David. He's a young man himself. David sent t- ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. That tells us something right there. Greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, Peace be to you, peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. That's what the servants of David said to Nabal. Three times they say, peace to you, peace to your house, peace, that everything that has to do with Nabal, no peace. It's a beautiful way of addressing someone. Peace be to you, peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. Now I have heard that you have shears. In other words, it's a time of shearing. Your shepherds were with us, and we did not hurt them, nor was there anything missing from them all the while they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son, David. They're being very, very uh, honorable in what they're saying. They're, They're being very respectful of Nabal in this. Notice what they say again. Remember, David's got 600 mouths to feed. And we don't even know if some of those people had their wives with them, maybe some children. We really don't know the total number that David is over, but we know as warriors, we've got at least 600. That's a lot of people to feed, especially when you're in a wilderness. How much are you really going to find to eat in the wilderness? But here, Nabal had his sheep out in the wilderness with his own shepherds, and and the, the men of David are saying, look, we were there with them. We could have stolen those sheep. We could have fed ourselves off of your abundance, but we didn't. In fact, we guarded your sheep. We did nothing to hurt your people. In fact, we helped you. And it's a, it's a festival day. We are responsible for you having much of the feast that you're having because we guarded your flocks. We made sure nobody robbed. We made sure nobody killed your shepherds. Here's the, the, the flock. Here it is. Now, this is a feast day. It's a time of celebration. We've had a hand in that. Now, please, as it comes into, as it comes into your hand, we're not asking for anything special, but as a blessing comes to your mind, Please send it to us and send it to your son, David, who, see, who gives you the respect of a father. Very respectful things to do. So we go on to 1 Samuel 25, 9 through 11. So when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to these words, in the name of David, and waited. Then Nabal answered David's servants, and he said, Who is David? Now, this, David says, tell him in my name, right? Well, that, you know, if your name's George Gahittlefunk, it doesn't mean anything, you know? Tell him, George, G- George Gahittlefunk sent us to get this, the, these lambs from you. No, we come in the name of David. David is a national hero. Everybody knows David. And in fact, the fact that he's such a hero is the fact that he's running from Saul. Because remember, they'd come back from the battles of the Philistines and the women would come out and sing their praise and say, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. Everybody knew about Goliath. This man knows. Nabal knows. And he's being ignorant. And so he says to these young men, Who is David? Doesn't mean anything to me. Who is this David? And who is the son of Jesse? Nobody said he was the son of Jesse. He knew. There are many servants nowadays who break away each from his master. Shall I then take my bread? Notice the mice here. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shears and give it to men who I do not know where they are from? In other words, he's probably just... To to me, David could just be a a bad servant that ran away from home. That's really an insult to him. And he says, this this is what I think of of your David. He has come for my bread, my water, my meat, and my shears. This brings us... Excuse me a second. This brings us to our next teaching lesson, which is... Let's keep going. Rich, rich or poor, plenty or little, all that we have is on loan from God and He expects us to use it for His glory. I know we all need that, just sometimes we need to be reminded of it. Sometimes we think that tithe belongs to God, but the rest belongs to us. None of it belongs to us. Amen? None of it belongs to us. Well, you guys are quiet. It's all His, is it not? The cattle on a thousand hills are His. Everything we have is God's. Even our bodies, even our spirits. It says your body is not your own. It's been paid for with a price. 
Everything's been paid for with a price. The very air in our lungs, everything we have is on loan from God, and He expects us to use it for His glory. If Nabal was a man of God, he would have given those guys something just in celebrating, just in helping for God to be worshipped during this feast day. He would have thanked them for their services to helping him. But he's an ignorant, ignorant man, and he looks at it as my water, my meat, my shears, and uh, my bread. And it doesn't work that way. Again, rich or poor, plenty or little, all that we have is on loan from God, and he expects us to use it for his glory. Let's go on then to 1 Samuel 25, 12 and 13. So he's finished saying this insult to David. So David's young men turned on their heels and went back. They, you know, they weren't going to argue with him. They weren't going to say anything. They just zipped. They turned and went back. And they came and told all these words. Then David said to his men, Every man gird on his sword. So every man girded on his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And about 400 men went with David and 200 stayed with the supplies. Taking 400 men to a farmer. He's a big farmer, but he's still a farmer. He's not an army. He doesn't have an army. If they were going to fight David, they'd have to fight probably with pitchforks and things like that. It's not a standing army. And here David is irate. He's mad. His feelings are hurt. And he's going to take 400 of his best men. And uh, he leaves 200 with the supplies. And he's going out to... I'm sorry, I had a worldly thought. There. I was going to say, he's going out there to kick butt and take names. But that's exactly what he's doing. He's going out there to let, let, you know, just to, to bring his anger against him. We'll come back to that in a moment. Now, one of the young men that, that had been present for that speech, now one of the young men told Abigail, you got this idea that nobody, Nabal is one of those guys, you only talk to him if you have to. He's a sarcastic, mean, stupid man. Yet he's very rich. And unfortunately, because he's very rich, you have to have contact with him. You have to have doings with him. You have to do business with him. You are his servant. You've got to deal with him. But nobody wants to. And I imagine Ab Abigail got more, more things told in her ear than anybody else. She knew more things than Nabal. I'm sure they wanted to talk to her. She seems like a very pleasant woman, a good woman. And uh, the servants, I'm sure, would tell her. So it says, Now one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Look! David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, to greet him. They did it respectfully, and he reviled them. But the men were very good to us, and we were not hurt when we were out there in the wilderness. They were good. They protected us. Nor did we miss anything. Nobody stole from us as we, uh, as we accompanied them. You know, they, did, they were hungry, and they didn't take any of our sheep. They were hungry, and they didn't go through any of our stuff. They didn't steal anything from us. They didn't take anything from us. In fact, it says they were a wall to us. Is when we were in the fields, they were a wall to us both by night and by day. All the time we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now therefore, no one consider what you will do, speaking to Abigail, for harm is determined against your master and against all his household. For he is such a scoundrel that no one can speak to him. Abigail finds out from this young man that David has already tried to make contact with Nabal by sending his messengers, honoring him. He, he, he of course, disrespects them. And uh, they, in fact, when, after all, like I say, when they were a wall to his men and were good to him, and when they, were good to, when they were good to Nabal's men, they were being good to Nabal. It says, let's go on to uh, verse 25, 18. Then Abigail made haste. You notice she doesn't have to stand around going, oh, what am I going to do? I'm just scared. Oh, there's a, there's a problem coming. I don't know what to do about it. This is a very talented lady. It's a very, it's very talented. It says, Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves of bread. She knows she doesn't have much time. She takes 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine. They're already getting ready for the feast. This is stuff that's already prepared. Took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five sayas of roasted grain already roasted, 100 clusters of grapes, of, of raisins rather, and 200 cakes of figs, and loaded them on donkeys. So she's, she's taking a lot of this festival food, and she's loading it on a donkey. And this brings us to our next lesson of, of the day, is behind every successful, successful man is a surprised wife. Amen. That, that is not really how it goes. No, just normally there's a, very, there's a very great woman behind a successful man, but this is the truth. Behind every successful man, there's a surprised woman. 
Uh, I can tell you in my life, I, I've tried so many dumb things in my life, and my wife stood with me and stuff, but man, she was the smarter one. She always used to tell me when she was working at Clancy's and people would call, they'd say, well, I gotta talk to the man in charge. She said, you wanna talk to the man in charge or the woman that knows what's going on? Ha, ha, ha. Where are you guys today? My goodness. Abigail makes a quick decision and takes immediate action. Let's go on to verse 25, 19 through 22. And she said to her servants, go on before me. See, I am coming after you. In other words, I'll follow behind you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. He would have put the kibosh on the whole thing and gotten killed. So it was as she rode on the donkey that she went down and under cover of the hill. And there were David and his men. Sure enough, they're on their way. Coming down toward her and she met them. Now David has said, surely in vain I have protected all that this fellow has in the wilderness. This was foolish of us to have done that. We already could have been eating, but we were respectful. We didn't touch anything that wasn't ours, so that nothing more also to the enemies of David, if I leave one, may God do so and more so to the enemies of David, if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. In other words, by morning I will have every, every male in this village, every male in this city, every male that belongs to Nabal will be dead. Why? Because David's got a hot temper. He's got a hot temper. Remember, he wouldn't touch Saul, the man who was going to kill him, but he will wipe out a foul-mouthed farmer. We'll come back to that. David is in a murderous frenzy, and then here comes Abigail. First Samuel 25, 23, and 24. Now when Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed down to the ground. She assumes the position of the servant. The position of the servant. So she fell at his feet and said, notice how respectful and, I don't even know the right word here. She, you know, she, 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 she's just going to the extreme to make David happy. He says, on, she fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me, let this iniquity be. Putting her life on the line. She doesn't know David won't kill her. She don't know that. So she says, put it on me. So here she is standing in for her stupid, ignorant husband that nobody likes, nobody can get along with. She's been putting up with him for God knows how many years. And she, took some, she tells David, blame me. If you're going to kill anybody, kill me. She says, she says, she fell at his feet and she said, oh my, oh my Lord, oh, on me let this iniquity be. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. It refers to herself over and over again as his servant, as his maidservant. And she asks humbly that he will listen to what she has to say. And in her, in her being so respectful of David, all the time she's being respectful, his anger is getting lower and lower. The temperature is going down. She is lowering the temperatures, but she's being the peacemaker. She goes on to say in verse 27, please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal. She calls her own husband a scoundrel. She doesn't try to defend him. For as his name is, so is he. I didn't tell you that the word Nabal means fool. That's why she means, as his name is, so is he. Now you had to wonder what was going on in his parents' life. How many people would have a baby and say, let's name him fool, you know? But maybe it was prophetic, but they, they called the kid fool, you know? Nabal. So she says, please, my Lord, Regard this, do not regard this scoundrel Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. He's a fool. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. Oh, I sure typed that wrong. But she says, I didn't see the young men you said. In other words, it would have been a different outcome had I been there, but I wasn't there. So she ends up by saying in verse 25, please forgive the trespass of your maidservant. Let's go on to 1 Samuel 25 and 26. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, and as she's making an oath, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek harm from my Lord be as Nabal. She goes on then uh, in verse 25, 28. And now this present which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to your young men that, they, that, that, that follow my Lord. 
For the Lord will certainly make my Lord an enduring, an enduring house. Here she's almost actually prophesying. She says, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord, for my Lord, capital L, for my God will certainly make my Lord David an enduring house because my Lord David fights the battles of the Lord and evil is not found in him throughout your days. That may be the most important sentence in everything we're reading. Look at it again. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives, she's almost like swearing an oath here. What she's saying here really is, in God's name, I'm telling you this. As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back, Abigail realizes that, that God has used you to hold David back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging your... What did we just read? Do not avenge yourselves. David would not avenge himself with his worst enemy, but he's ready to go out and kill a man that's a farmer that's got a bad mouth and a bad temper. And you can look, we can stop this right now. We only got a few more verses to go through. And here's the question. Who was worse, Nabal or David? Do we, want, we don't want to be like Nabal, but we surely don't want to be like David. You get it? Look at what she's saying. I held you back from coming to bloodshed. Remember when David wanted to build a temple and God says, you're not going to build my temple? There is too much blood on your hands. What's she saying? I kept you from spilling. How much more blood would have been on David's hands if Abigail hadn't been there? He'd have killed Nabal. He'd have killed all the men. He'd have probably stolen sheep and done anything he wanted to do. And look at what she says. The Lord, the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand. He, you know, he knows he's going to be avenged. Saul will, he'll be avenged with Saul, but he knows that like we just said. Saul's going to die, but it's not going to be by David's hand. She's saying the same thing here. God's going to take her and Nabal, but David, this isn't going to be by your hands. Now then, let your enemies and those who seek harm, seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. She's just nailed it. She has kept David from something very, very terrible. Something, something that is worse than what he would have planned to do. We go to verses 29 through 31. She continues in, in speaking like a prophet. She says, Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life. She's talking about Saul. But the life of my Lord shall be bound to the bundle of the living. That was, he'll be found with the living, with the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. I wonder if she knew about Goliath. I wonder if that's an analogy there because we talked about the pocket of the sling that they whirl and the, ro and the rock went out and killed Goliath. She's also saying, David, all your enemies are going to be like that rock. They're going to be thrown as a sling out of your life. And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has anointed you ruler over Israel. In other words, I, we know what's coming. It's inevitable. You will be the ruler of Israel. That this will be of no grief to you. What will be of no grief to him? That he did this dumb thing. Going to kill a farmer and his workers. What a dumb thing to do. And she says, you're going to have, there's going to come a time when you're on the throne. And you're going to regret it. And you're going to say to yourself how stupid I was. Haven't all of us done stupid things? And later in our lives said, boy, if I could go back and redo that, I would have done it. Amen. We all have. Amen. You know, and she's saying, you know, you don't want to have these kind of thoughts when you're older. In fact, think back and now and say, God sure blessed me with Abigail because she kept me from doing something very, very stupid. Praise God for the people he puts in our lives that keeps us from doing the stupidity that we would do. I've done so many stupid things. I guess I'm a little lenient more towards the people who do things, a little more forgiving sometimes because I've been there myself. I remember when we first moved up here. you got to remember how Crossroads used to be. Car after car after car, honking and spe squealing tires. We couldn't sleep. This went on month after month after month after month, just the way it was. Then one, one summer night I got woke up because I keep hearing this bang, bang, bang. There was a kid running around the block in, a, in his car. Every time he got to my trash can, he'd open the door and smash the trash can. So he split the whole thing inside. I was, by this time, I was so mad. I'm just telling you how dumb you can be. I'm using me as an example. I was so stupid, I went and got a brick. And I hit at the end of my driveway. I said, the next time he does this, he's getting a brick through his windshield. You know, I could have killed that kid. But I was so mad, you don't think right, you know? I understand that. There can be people, there can be times, you, you can get that frustrated. If you haven't, then God bless you. But some of us have, know what I'm talking about. You can ju just get that frustrated that you'll do something really dumb. So thank God that God, you know, sh sh spares dumb people, you know? 
and hopefully we've been used of God to stop somebody doing something stupid in their lives, and hopefully somebody's been in our lives that won't let us do a stupid thing. He says, uh, so she's saying this. Uh, he, he says that this will be no grief to you nor offense of heart uh, uh, to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without a cause, which is what it would have been, or that my Lord has avenged himself. You had broken the rules with God. God says he'll be your vengeance and you were going to take it in your own hands. But when the Lord has dealt well with, with my Lord, then remember your maidservant. In other words, when you someday think back on all this, Remember your maidservant. Have a, have a kind thought towards me. I don't get kind thoughts from my husband. But I'd ask you, maybe I could get kind thoughts from you someplace in the future that you'll remember what I tried to do to help you. And David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to me. This is verse 32 and 33. Who, he recognizes she's from God who sent you this day to me. And blessed is your advice, and blessed are you, because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. I have to think sometimes how many husbands out there are blessed because they have a God-fearing wife. You know, they're not nearly going to have the problems in life. Even if they don't believe, they're under the coverage of the, of the woman that prays for them. And, I, and you know it's a lot because you go in these churches, and these churches are, many of these churches are just filled with women. Where are the men? The men aren't there, but there's the women in the, in the fight, in the spiritual battle, praying for their families, praying for their children, praying, setting examples for their kids. He goes on to say in verse 34, For indeed, as the Lord of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to me, surely by morning light no male should have been left to Nabal. So now he's seeing himself what he had planned to do and how wrong it would be. It says in verse 35, So David received from her hand what she brought him and said to her, Go up in peace to your house. See, I have heeded your advice and respected your person. She is the beautiful woman of the, the, the last chapter of Proverbs, the, the good wife, the good woman, the blessing that she is in, in her house and in their business and everything else. Nabal didn't realize how good he had it. And then, of course, our next lesson is this. You're all familiar with this from Proverbs. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. If she had come out harsh to David, who do you think you are? You're coming against my husband? They tell me you're coming with these guys? Who do you think you are? I mean, she could have got all over him. She could have given him a hard time, and it would have been a completely different story. I see this so often. And I see it a lot of times in the prison, unfortunately, that people want to deal with something right now you know, harshly, deal with something, you know, want to deal with something. And I think that's because in their own lives, they have no authority. Uh, you, they have no authority over their own lives. They are told when they can eat, basically when they can go to the bathroom, basically when they can go in their cells, when they can exercise, you know, you know what they have to eat, everything. I mean, it's just their lives are so structured that when you give them some authority of their own, this is the only authority they have if, if they're going to take authority in the prison church, is sometimes they want to deal with it right away. We got a nip, nip, nip this in the bud. I said, no, you need to be patient and give God time. Sometimes we, we do better off to pray than to speak. There's a time to speak. I told you when I had breakfast that morning with, what was his name, Susan? The guy that the, the road's named for in, in Office 70 in O'Fallon, the, the, the re realtor, T.R. Hughes, T.R. Hughes. I had breakfast with T.R. Hughes, not because we, me and him were anything, we just happened to be working for the same company. He owned a cabinet company in, 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 in uh, Wentzville, and I was working with him, or in, uh, I mean, Wentzville, Chesterfield, rather. And anyway, he, he made, I won't forget him telling me this. He said, Skip, he said, many times, he says, I have staff meetings in my business. He said, and so he says, there's times where I see people doing something that was wrong. It was stupid. It cost us money. It shouldn't have happened. He said, my first response is to get in that staff meeting and just run them up one side and down the other in front of the other people. It embarrasses them and teaches them a lesson they won't forget. He said, but I have learned over the years, he said, whenever I feel like doing that, to wait 24 hours. He says, because 24 hours can make a big difference. And he said this, if it still needs to be said 24 hours later, then it needs to be said anyway, and you can still do it. But don't do it in the heat of passion. Don't do it. Does that make sense? It really does. It really does. It's like you always say, Ken, people at work would always try to look for something people were doing wrong rather than trying to find something people were doing right. 
And uh, so anyway, a soft word can turn away wrath, but a harsh word just stirs up anger. And lastly, we come to 1 Samuel 25, 36 through 42, and then through 44, and we're done. And we will have communion. It says now, Now Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was, holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. Therefore she told him nothing, little or much, until morning light. So it was in the morning, when the wine had gone from Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him. That's hard to understand because he's still living. But his heart died within him, and he became like a stone. Then it happened after about 10 days that the Lord struck Nabal and he died. So we really don't know what those 10 days were like, but they must have been horrible for Nabal. So when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord. There you go. Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal. He's realizing now, God took care of it. God took care. I didn't have to do what I was going to do. How stupid it would have been for me to have done that. God took care of it. Have you ever had a time, you can't answer this, but I'm just going to ask you to think. Have you ever had a time when God brought judgment into somebody's life because of you? Because of his love for you? I have. It's not a funny thing. In fact, if you realize sometimes what God will do, you will pray for their forgiveness. Let's go on. Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded in the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept his servant from evil. He's praising God for that. He's praising God for Abigail. For the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal on his own head. And David sent and proposed to Abigail. Doesn't wait long, does he? David sent and proposed to Abigail. Of course, I didn't say this earlier, but when a woman comes to a man with food, she's already found a way to his heart. And she's already done that with David. And David sent and proposed to Abigail to take her as wife. When the servants of David come to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her, saying, David sent us to you to ask you to become his wife. Then she arose, bowed down her face to the earth, recognizing her blessing. And she said, here is your maidservant, a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. David's not even there. And she says, I am a maidservant, and I will wash your feet. So Abigail rose in haste and rode on a donkey attended by five of her maidens, and she followed the messengers of David and became his wife. Good ending. Last verses, 43 and 44. David also took a Ahinoam of, of Jezreel, and so both of them were his wives. But Saul had given Michal, his, his, his middle daughter, that originally to David, his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Lahish, who was from Gallium. And all, all this is saying here is that you don't know what God will do. None of us know what God will do. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. They're higher than our ways. Quit, quit. All of us need to quit buttoning in on God's territory and just say, Lord, here's the problem. You know, give me wisdom how to handle it. But let me, you know, but let me be a man of peace as much as possible. There's a time to raise your voice. But it isn't all the time. And it needs to be well thought of if we do. So, I need two helpers for communion here. You up to it? Ah, oh, here we go. I should look right before I look left. Here we go.